If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to the third chapter of Habakkuk. Third chapter of Habakkuk. If you're not sure exactly where that is, go to the start of the New Testament, Matthew. Hang a left. Go five books to the left, and you'll be right there at Habakkuk. <clears throat> I'll share a couple of stories with you to get started uh, today. Uh, we've gone through this Christmas season, and uh, it's always a time of rejoicing. We can rejoice in the Lord because of um, the cel- and we celebrate His birth. But you know what? I got to thinking back the other day about rejoicing. I can rejoice, and I know my brother can also, uh, because we had a, a I don't, it was just a mischievous childhood. It seemed like we were always into something. And I want to share a couple stories with you. Uh, I don't remember who came up with the idea, Mike or I, but we, one year we got bicycles for, for Christmas, and uh, this had to have been later on in the summer that uh, we were out riding, and uh, we decided, well, we wanted to see how fast they could go. Well, the thing was, we put Mike on the handlebars, let him ride there. I would do the pedaling and the steering. So off we took, down the hill of our street we went, and there was a road that you had to cross, two-lane road. And I told him as we got down to the bottom of the hill, I said, you need to let me know if there's any cars coming. If there's any cars coming, we're going to need to stop. I don't want to get hit by a car. Okay? So got down to the bottom just to fly, and probably running on a bicycle about 15 miles an hour. And I hollered out, any cars coming? No cars, no cars. Crossed the road we went, down into the parking lot where my mom worked, and we were, we were just, we were getting with it. We were going as fast as we could go. And uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, have you all seen these concrete blocks that you pull your car into and, and you stop? We hit one of those things on a bicycle running about 15 miles an hour. And the only thing I can remember is I remember Mike and the bike going over the top of me landing on the asphalt and sliding. In fact, I still got scars on my shoulder and my side where I slid across the asphalt. And uh, we got up, and I could tell Mike was stunned. Uh, He was bleeding some. I was like (laughs) in la-la land. And we looked at the wheel of the bike, and it's like somebody had taken a slice of pie out of it. And uh, I thought, well, we can't ride this anymore, so we had to just walk the bike home as we came over the hill. My mom saw us walking the bike. She knew something was wrong. Something wasn't right because we never, we never walked the bike. So, but we had to tell her what the truth was, what we'd been doing, where we'd gone, what happened. Now, our parents were like many parents back then, uh, and even some today, they always have to know the truth. They always have to know the truth, what happened, and t- telling them, if you didn't tell them the truth, it was worse than the crime that you'd already committed. So you had, I keep that in mind now, telling the truth, because later that summer, Mike and I were in the basement, and uh, we had found a pack of firecrackers, those black cat firecrackers. We thought, well, we're going to have some fun. We'll just go out in the backyard, and we'll light those, and we'll have a good old time. Well, we did. We took them outside, and lo and behold, my dad was out in the backyard. He was laying in one of those chase lounges. He had a ball cap pulled down over his face. He was listening to the ball game, and he was sound asleep. Mike looked at me, and I looked at him, and I thought, oh, we're we're cruising for a bruising now. So, But we went ahead, Mike with the firecrackers, threw him, and it landed within about 10 foot of him. Now, folks, I saw my dad move quick a lot of times. But he came out of that lounge chair, the hat went one way, the radio that he was listening to went another way, came out of that chair like a rocket. We ran around to the front of the house, in the front door. My mom wanted to know where we was going. I said, we're running from him. We're running from a dad. He said, you better stop right here. Better stop right here. And sure enough, my dad come barreling in that door. He was hotter than a firecracker. And I looked at Mike. And he had that look like the death angel had just come in the front door. <laughs> he, he was gonna, But he grabbed Mike, and he shook him, and he asked him, he said, you shooting firecrackers? And Mike just looked up at him and said, no, not now I'm not. 
<laughs> so, but he always told the truth, always told the truth, and it was good. So we had we could stand and tell stories forever and a day. But go ahead and stand with me. I want to read uh, in Habakkuk chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 17 and read to the end of the chapter. Habakkuk chapter 3, starting verse 17. The Bible says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Father, we thank you for the time that we can be together. I trust that you'll bless us. I pray that uh, you'll bless your word. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless the message. Lord, your word tells us that we need to always rejoice in you. And Father, that is not always easy to do. But Lord, we want to try. Thank you, Father, for each one that is here. Ask your blessings upon them. For those who are watching online, Lord, uh, we thank you that... Um, we're able to, to visit and be a part uh, of the worship service in the homes. We thank you for that. Now be with us and guide us in all that we say and do. Pray that you'll receive the honor and glory, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Please be seated. In her book, The Hiding Place, Corey Tinboom relates an, in an incident that taught her how to be thankful for things that we're normally not thankful for. Now, she and her sister, uh, who were prisoners of the Nazis, had just been transferred to a new prison camp. They okay, got transferred to a new prison camp, and they, the name of the camp was Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück. Now, as they moved into the barracks, they found that the barracks was nasty. It was way overcrowded. Over, it was like sardines. Plus, on top of all that, it was infested with fleas. Now then, they, the scripture that morning uh, from their Bibles that they had smuggled into the prison camp was out of 1 Thessalonians, and it reminded them to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Well, Betsy told Corey, we just need, uh, uh, Corey, we just need to stop right here and pray and give thanks for all the aspects, all the details of our new living quarters. Well, Corey said that she was not going to, she was not going to give thanks for the fleas. Says there it was just wasn't going to happen. So Betsy kept prodding her and prodding her, and finally Corey, uh, she gave in and she gave, uh, she was thankful for the fleas that were in their uh, barracks. Well, you know what. Time went on, and the days turned to weeks, the weeks turned to months, the month turned to years, and they noticed a pattern that had started to develop. And it was simply this. When they decided to hold Bible study or devotions, or sometimes they were even able to do church, uh, there was very little interference or interruptions from the German guards. Well, later on, several months later, they found out that the reason why the guards would come into the barracks was simply the fact that they wouldn't come where the fleas were. So, so we see that uh, Corey was able to bless and be thankful for fleas, and it's amazing how God can use things for His glory and for good. And we look at Habakkuk, we see that Habakkuk had experienced crop failure, Devastation, destruction, all had come to the land of Judah. Habakkuk was determined to praise the Lord, was going to rejoice in the Lord no matter what the circumstances were. You know, that's not easy to do. That is not easy to do. You and I also, we can rejoice in harsh circumstances, in trials, in tribulations. You know, great times are on the mountain. We can always rejoice in the Lord when we're on the mountain, but when we're in the valley, that's where we learn, and that's tough to rejoice and praise the Lord when we're having difficulties, tribe, times, uh, and trials and tribulations come our way. You know what? Troubles are not going to stop. Troubles in our lifetime are not going to stop 
but it's how we choose to react to all those times of difficulty, all those times of stress, and all those times of temptation. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. This morning, I want to take a little bit of time and just share with you some reasons why we can always rejoice in the Lord, no matter what circumstances we're in. And it's, it's, I've had people tell me, well, you don't understand the circumstances that I'm in. I don't have a job. I'm filing for bankruptcy. We've had kids that's been in accidents. We've had uh, partners or family members that have passed away. But the Bible still tells us in the midst of all that that we should rejoice. So I want to give you a few reasons why you can always do that. And first of all, we can always rejoice in the Lord because of who He is. Because of who He is. He is our rock. Folks, the world is constantly changing. People are constantly changing. Culture is changing. Society is changing all the time. But you know what? The Lord is right. He never changes. He's always the same. He's the same today as He was 100,000 years ago. He's the same today as He will be 100,000 years from now. He's our sustainer. He in of Himself is eternal life. He has told us that if we will receive Christ as our Savior, we will have eternal life. Here's the thing. For believers, many of us believe that eternal life starts when we pass from this world to the next. For the believer, eternal life starts at the moment of salvation. When, you're sa when you become saved, your eternal salvation begins. God is our shepherd. He watches over the flock constantly. He's our creator. Everything that you see, as far as the eye can see, was made and created by God and for His pleasure. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's our Heavenly Father. He's, a, he's our guide. He's our leader. He is our hope. He's the only hope that we have if we plan on going to a place called heaven. We sing that song many times, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The Lord wears all these hats. Y'all remember a commercial years ago about the fireman's fund, and it would show the, the insurance agent, he always had a different hat on as he comes to the picture. Well, the Lord has, is like that. He wears all these different hats. He is all of these things to all people, and yet he is still able to manage the universe. The sun comes up at the same time, sets at the same time. All the stars and the planets stay in their rotation. All of them, he's, ma he's managing all that, yet he's concerned about you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Secondly, we're able to uh, praise the Lord and always rejoice because we can experience God's power. We can experience His power. Acts 1.8 tells us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I was reading a story about uh, a man by the name of Herbert Jackson. Uh, he was a missionary and he was telling how he had got to his new station and was assigned a car that wouldn't start without a push. Mm. He thought and he pondered about his situation. And he devised a plan. And the plan was this. He would go to the school every morning, ask permission to take some of the students out of class. He'd take them home. They would push his car and push it fast enough that it would start. He'd give them a ride back to school. The rest of the day, he would make his rounds, and he either had to park the car on a hill or he had to leave it running. Well, that, it, that plan worked for about two years, and his family got sick, and he had to return to the United States, and a new missionary came. Well, when the new missionary came, he was explaining the arrangement about how he would get the car started. And the new missionary started to look under... And he said, well, Dr. Jackson, he said, look at this loose cable here. He said, I believe this is your problem. So he put the loose battery cable back on, tightened it up, went around, got in the car, sat down, turned the key. And to Jackson's astonishment, the engine roared to life. 
The power was there all the time. It was just the loose connection that kept Jackson from putting all of that power together to good use. Now, J.B. Phillips, who was an English Bible scholar and a clergyman and author, kind of paraphrased uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 19 to 20 when he said, How tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. Folks, the power for you and me is the same today as it was a thousand years ago. The power is available. It's there. Guess what? We just need to plug into the power. And when you're plugged into the power, it gives a new meaning to the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We see that, y'all remember the story about Peter? Peter got out of the boat and walking on the water. Well, Jesus had had a long day, been doing a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching. He had the crowds dispersed, put the disciples in a boat and sent them to the other side of the lake. And Jesus went up on the mountainside by himself to have a time of prayer. And the Bible says in the fourth watch, he came to the disciples walking on the water. And the disciples thought it was a ghost. Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Of course, old Peter, you know, you know how Peter was. He had a pipe in there. He said, well, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. What did Jesus do? Come on, Peter. Come on out. Come on out and be on the water. You know what? He got real serious then. Peter began to submit to the Lord, began to surrender Listen, Peter was engulfed with Jesus. He was consumed with Jesus. And as he started to step out of the boat, his eyes were riveted. His sole attention, his sole focus was on the Lord Jesus. And when he stepped out of the boat, he didn't step into the water. He stepped onto the water. And he walked. He walked on the water step by step coming toward Jesus until the wind. The wind distracted him. And when the wind distracted him, or if you use the terminology that I'm trying to use right here, when Peter disconnected himself from the power source, which was Jesus, what happened to him? <whistles> Down he went. He started to sink. Well, he, the power was there for Peter all the time. The power was there for Dr. Jackson all the time. The power was there as we look back on the New Testament church. The New Testament church was a powerful church. There was much prayer, and where there's much prayer, there's much power. The church back then prayed in the morning, throughout the morning, lunchtime, the afternoon, even in the evening. Didn't have many programs like we have today. But people were coming to the Lord. People were coming to the church. And there was much power in the church, the New Testament church, because of the amount of prayer. Kind of flip and think about the modern day church. The modern day church, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. Be just real honest. The modern day church does not have the power that the New Testament church had. And there's a reason for that. Where there's much power, there's much prayer. And when there's little power, very little prayer. The church today, we have got more programs. We got committees. We got a finance committee, personnel committee, benevolence committee. We've got deacons. We've got flower committee. We got every kind of committee. But what we don't have is an abundance of prayer warriors that no matter what, we're going to pray. We need to come together and pray and pray and pray. And like I said a while ago, it brings to, into view that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The strength and the power come from the Lord when we are plugged into Him, 
when we're plugged in to that eternal power source. One of the things that the, the New, New Testament church was doing was praying all the time. And that's another reason that we can always rejoice in the Lord. We can stop anywhere, place, or time and talk to and pray to our Heavenly Father. Now, on Monday and Thursday, we are studying um, uh, a book written by Gregory Frizzell on how to develop a dynamic prayer life. Uh, and he gives us a lot of suggestions about prayer. He tells us that prayer is at the heart and soul of every, every successful relationship. Prayer is at the center of it. Prayer is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial to every single solitary area in the believer's life. Let me ask you some questions right quick. Real simple answer. They all got the same answer, okay? How do you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? How do you abide in Christ and allow Him to live His life through you? How do you grow as a Christian? How do you overcome temptation and weakness? How do you resist Satan and wage effective spiritual warfare? How do you confess your sins? How are you filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you obtain guidance and wisdom from God? And finally, how do you experience the power to serve God effectively? Simple answer, two words for each question. Through prayer. It's through prayer. You know, one of the greatest, the greatest requests that we can ask God for is simply the question that the disciples asked Jesus. He said, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So people say, how do you learn to pray? You just pray. You just pray. You've got to practice. There was a story about a big old boy that went to his head football coach, and he wanted to play on a football team. And the coach kind of looked at him, kind of sized him up and everything, and big old boy, about 6'7", about 330, 340. And the coach told him, said, you know, I believe you could be an asset to our team. He said, uh, practice is tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Be there. 4 o'clock the next day came and was gone, and... Young man never showed up. Next day went by, didn't see him. Next day after that, still didn't show up. Finally caught up with the coach the next day. He said, oh, I'm still want, I still want to be on the football team. Coach told him again, you got to come to the practice. You want to play? You want to learn how to play football? You got to come to the practice. Well, guess what? Another week went by. He never saw him. We, after a week, same guy showed up. Coach, I'm still interested in being on the football team. He says, no, you're not. He said, don't waste my time. Don't waste my time. I'm headed for practice over here right now. I want to go be with these guys that are seriously interested in playing football. They want to practice. You don't. You know what? If we want to pray, we have to practice. We have to practice. We must learn to view prayer from God's perspective, and we'll never fully understand prayer until we grasp, until we get a hold of the primary purposes for prayer. Prayer is God's primary means by which we come to know Him, that we worship Him, and how we experience transformation through the indwelling Christ. It's all through prayer. Prayer is not about how much we can get out of God. It is not. Prayer is about what it is the Lord, the purpose the Lord wants to use us for as He works in and through us. What is His purpose? He wants to use us in a great way. Prayer is a great way to hear the Lord's voice, and it's a way that he is able to abide in us as we go about our daily lives from day to day. Here's the great secret to prayer. Somebody said, oh, is there a secret to all that? Great secret to prayer is simply this, to align ourselves to God's purposes rather than seeking to align Him to ours. Look, we have to remember, He's the one that's driving the boat. 
We need to get on board with what he's got going for us to go where he wants us to go and to do what he wants us to do. And then we see we can always rejoice in the Lord because he's going to protect us. He's going to protect us. The Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, that but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. True. You know, think about protecting us. And I thought about before, before I got saved. I thought, you know what? I lived a carefree life. I went where I wanted to go. I did whatever I wanted to do. Saw whoever I wanted to see. But you know what? All of that changed. On August the 26th, 1977, everything came to a screeching woe. And this war, this war erupted inside of me. And that's been over 40 years ago. It still hasn't gone away. In fact, it gets more intense every single day day. We have to understand, when you become born again, you just stepped into the arena of spiritual warfare. We have to understand that the devil wants to steal, to kill, and destroy you. That's his purpose. That's what he wants to do. My mom always used to tell me, he said, you know what? Misery loves company. You know what? The devil wants to take as many as he can to the lake of fire. Don't go down that road, folks. Don't go down that road. We all remember the cartoon uh, years ago with Fred Flintstone? We'd always watch Fred Flintstone on Friday night, but this one particular episode had this little angel on Fred's shoulder over here, had this little demon on this shoulder over here, and they were bickering back and forth as to what Fred was going to do. Is he going to do the right thing? Is he going to do the wrong thing? And you know what? I thought that was funny at the time, but you know what? There was a lot of truth in that cartoon. You know, the devil's always wanting us to do the wrong thing. He's never going to lead you in the right direction. You know, you think about we come to church on Sunday all dressed up. We look great. You know, we never know from looking at the, uh, by the outside that, you know, there's a spiritual war going on in the inside. All of us have that if you've truly been born again. Think about this, though. I have a question for you. And the question is the title of a book written by Charles Stanley, and it's simply this. Are you winning the battle on the inside? Are you winning the battle on the inside? So many times we go day to day, and you know what? We're not winning. We don't even try. You know, the Lord is protecting us. He gives us a full armor of God to be able to do what? To be able to protect ourselves. I think about going back to the scripture in Exodus chapter 14. I want to read. Think about this. Going even back to Exodus 14, let me set this up right quick, that the nation of Israel has come out of Egypt and they're headed toward the promised land. And ended up, they got to the Red Sea, couldn't go any further, and what, what, what happened? Pharaoh was right behind them. He was right behind them, and his goal was to push them into the Red Sea. He was wanting to exterminate the entire nation of Israel. Wipe them all out. Think about that. There'd be no more Jewish people. If you think God wasn't thinking about you, if you think that even today he wasn't on your mind, is that right? He wasn't on your mind? Think about this. What was the lineage of Jesus? Was Jesus not a Jew? If Pharaoh had his way and he pushed the entire nation of Israel into the midst of the Red Sea, how would Jesus have ever got here? Somebody says, oh, well, he did just come up with plan B. Folks, I'll tell you what, the God I serve doesn't have a plan B. He's got plan A, and that's it, and he makes it work. There is no other plan. But you think about it. If there was no Jesus, we wouldn't have celebrated the birth of Christ like we did yesterday. If there's no Jesus, there would have been no cross. 
There had been no death on the cross. There had been no tomb. If there was no tomb, there would have been no resurrection. If there was no resurrection, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? No hope. There's no chance that we'd ever go to a place called heaven. God was thinking about you and protecting you even when we go back to chapters in Exodus and find out that we were on his mind. We were on his mind. Also, we can always rejoice in the Lord because of the promises that he's made to us. He promises that he's going to lead us in the right direction. Go back to the Exodus. There's a lot of great stories with Israel exiting Egypt and coming into the promised land. As Israel came out of Egypt, there was two ways that they could go. They could go by the way of the land of the Philistines or they could go by the way of the wilderness. The short way. The short way would have been to have gone through the land of the Philistines. Well, then why did God take them all the way out around by way of the wilderness? God knows and he knew and tells us in the scripture that if the people saw the warring and the fighting and the violence in the land of the Philistines, Israel would go back to Egypt. God didn't want them to go back to Egypt. He wanted them to go to the promised land. That's why he took them all the way out of the way because it accomplished his purpose. God will accomplish his purpose in our lives. One of the purposes that he has for you and me is to conform us to the image of his son. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3. You have a minute to turn there. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible tells us this. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. We shall see Him as He is. Think about it. One day we're going to be just like Christ. We're going to have a body like Christ, a mind like Christ. You know, no more pain, no more sorrow, none of those things. But he is working on us down here. There was a story about a man who had lost his job, lost his fortune in the stock market during a period of recession. And then on top of all that, he had lost his wife. His wife had passed away. But you know what? He held tenaciously to his faith. It doesn't budge. One day he was out looking for employment, or for employment, and he came by some brick masons that were stone masons that were working on a church. And they were chiseling on that stone and everything. And the guy asked him, said, where are you going to put that stone at? The mason looked up. He said, did you see that spot up there, way up there? He said, I'm chiseling this stone down here so it'll fit in up there. The guy left with tears in his eyes thinking, God is chiseling away at us down here so that we'll fit in up there. God promises us rest. <coughs> Excuse me. He promises us rest. He says, he says, come to me, you who are, what, weary and heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. But you know what? We don't have to wait to heaven till we get to heaven to, to enjoy that rest. God will give you rest here, peace and comfort. He cleanses us. He promises to cleanse you and me. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then one of the greatest promises that I find that's in the Bible is in John 14, the first three verses. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Those are great promises, folks, to think that one day we're going to be in heaven with the Lord throughout all of it. The question is, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? I want to use this illustration. I'm going to ask you to do some math for me, okay? I'm going to ask you to pick a number. I'm going to ask you to do it in your head. So if you're going to do it in your head, don't pick out a number of 2,721,834 and try to do the math in your head. Because if you're going to do some add, subtract, and divide, and all that, okay? All right, here we go. I want you, everybody, don't tell your neighbor. Everybody pick a number. Now, this is part of the invitation, all right? This is the invitation. It's twofold. Pick a number. I want you to double it. Add 10 more to it. Divide by 2. Now take away the number that you originally picked. Everybody got it? Sure. Did the math right. All right. If you did the math right, everyone should have come up With that number five. How do you do that? It's not a secret. Come see me after the service and I'll tell you how. But here's the analogy that I want you to see, okay? We all pick different numbers, okay? All pick different numbers. I gave you an equation or a formula. And with that formula, we all came up with one single answer. Same answer for everybody. The analogy is this. All of us have got different sin that's in our lives. Whatever it might be, it's, there's a variety there. God has provided us with the Bible. And with the Bible, we're able to determine how it is we're going to get to heaven. God chooses to reveal himself in the Bible. I like that word Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what the Bible is. We can know that the only way to heaven for you and for me and for all of mankind is through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're trying to get to heaven some other way, through your works, through your monies, what, you've missed the mark. You've missed the mark. Folks, time is of the essence right now. The Bible tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. I'm not so sure that's true. I wonder if he is not already standing. He is already standing at the right hand of the Father. He is, he's chomping at the bit, ready to come back. Are you ready? Folks, we don't have, you're not guaranteed another breath. You're not guaranteed another heartbeat. When I got down to this part of the message, I couldn't help but think about those people in Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee. I wonder how many of them thought that they were going to be here for this Christmas. And through the tragedy of bad weather and tornado, some of those folks were taken out. Some of them went home to be with the Lord. I wonder how many were not ready. We must be ready. No more, not guaranteed another heartbeat. Not another breath, but what if the Lord comes? What if the Lord would come today? Are you ready for his return? 